Good evening, everybody. Welcome. We're thrilled to see you all out here tonight with us for our conversation evening together. Uh, we're going to be discussing a topic that we think is very important, navigating trauma and loss. My name is Dr. Katie Bendell, and this is Dr. Keegan Barker. And we are psychologists with the Operational Stress Injury Clinic here at the Royal. So to start us off tonight, I thought I'd just give a brief summary of uh, who we are and what we do at the Operational Stress Injury Clinic. For those of you who may be less familiar, we are part of the Royal, which is our, uh, our hospital here, research and, and teaching hospital. Um, and we have many uh, different programs here at the Royal to meet a variety of needs. Our Operational Stress Injury Clinic works as an interdisciplinary team, which means that we have psychology, psychiatry, uh, clinical social workers, uh, nurses, etc., who work together to meet the needs of our clients. Our mandate as a clinic is to provide assessment and evidence-based treatment to Canadian Forces veterans as well as RCMP members and veterans who are experiencing any mental health difficulty as a result of their service. And that's what we call an operational stress injury, any psychological injury uh, that a person experiences as a result of service. So our clinic is part of a, a clinic, a network of 10 OSI clinics across the country. We were, have been open officially since 2009 and we've received approximately 1,200 referrals to date, although that number is climbing. Our clients range in age from 18 to 89, 16, excuse me, to 89 and are uh, primarily male. So if anybody's in the audience or, or anybody's listening and would like to learn more about our services or perhaps seek some services from our clinic, the way to do that is to approach our local uh, Veterans Affairs Canada office and seek a referral that way. So tonight, we're gonna cover two topics that are, that are pretty big but that are, have many common denominators. And these topics are trauma and loss. Our intention tonight is to give you an overview of trauma and to talk about common reactions to trauma as well as an overview of loss and common reactions to loss. And we're going to review how these experiences can be similar in many ways with the goal of talking through how we can manage uh, these life experiences. So to start us off, let's take a look at trauma and common reactions to trauma. So what is trauma? How do we know that we have experienced trauma or that someone we, we know or care about has gone through a traumatic experience? What we know is that trauma is an event or situation that's so emotionally distressing that it overwhelms our ability to cope. It becomes in some ways greater than us for a period of time and it can uh, lead us to organize our lives around the experience and we'll talk through what that means and what that looks like. So trauma may be um, exposure to actual death, oh, excuse me, threatened death or, or serious injury such as an accident, assault or torture or it can be exposure to sexual violence. It might mean that we ourselves have directly experienced the event or that we've directly witnessed uh, uh, the event. It might mean that we've learned about an event from a loved one um, and understood what they went through from their experience. We often think that trauma is one big thing that happens in a person's life that's shocking and upsetting, and that certainly can be and is the case. If we think about something like 9-11 um, or a natural disaster or a car accident uh, in someone's life, this all counts as, as potentially traumatic. But it can also be the case that trauma can occur over an extended period of time repeatedly. So an example of this might be an abusive relationship where there isn't one discrete uh, abusive experience, but there may be several and they may add up over time. Another example of this is uh, what we see in our line of work 
with uh, veterans who have experienced a number of traumatic events over their cor the course of their professional career and that these events over time uh, add up. So we certainly know intuitively that first responders, military uh, members um, and veterans uh, and other folks in this line of work, police services are more likely to encounter traumatic events um, in, in their line of work, but it's also the case, and research tells us, that 70% of civilian adults, so folks who don't work in that area, will be exposed to at least one traumatic event in our lifetimes. And so although this is a, a, a bit of a startling statistic, what this means is that actually the, the human brain and body are very adapted and, and well suited to recovering from trauma. So most of us, if we go through an experience that's traumatic, won't actually be traumatized in a lasting way. And we'll talk about natural recovery as we go. So first let's talk about some common, very normal reactions to trauma. Uh, especially in the immediate aftermath, so in the, the first few days and months and certainly weeks after an event. What is commonly experienced? We know that trauma impacts all of what it means to be human. So it impacts how we think, how we feel, how we behave and act in the world, our experience of our bodies, and our experience of each other in relationships. So if we take an example, um, let's say that a person has experienced a car accident that they found to be quite uh, traumatic, quite shocking. In terms of their thinking, some very common reactions are things like having unwanted thoughts uh, and memories of the accident itself that they kind of pop up in our minds and we don't invite them there, but they sort of intrude on our, our daily or weekly lives. It can be common to have dreams of uh, the event, of this, in this case, an accident. Uh, we can have nightmares of an accident. And we might find that our concentration and, and short-term memory is not what it once was, uh, as compared to before. And that's because the brain, uh, certainly immediately after a trauma, is very busy managing all of our thoughts and feelings and experiences. So that's actually very normal and, and what we expect. In terms of our emotions, you know, we can have any number of emotional reactions to a trauma. We can feel afraid and we can feel anxious. We can feel angry and irritable. We might have uh, guilt and shame, which are actually really common emotional reactions after trauma. And we might feel very sad and, and grieve, enter the grieving process. The, the message here is that there's no right way to feel after an experience like this and that we have a right to one and all of, of the emotions that we might be feeling. <coughs> Regarding our, our experience of our bodies, what we know is that folks feel really often quite tense, um, holding a lot of tension in our muscles, maybe having more headaches, uh, having a difficult time falling asleep or staying asleep. These can all be signs that our body is giving us, um, saying, you know, you've been through something really significant here and this needs your attention. It's common to feel very exhausted um, in the days, weeks, and months after an event, a traumatic event. And the insomnia that some folks experience might be the result of nightmares. So we might be waking up in the night because we're dreaming of what happened. Or it can be that we're having really restless sleeps because uh, our body's holding all of that tension and it's having a, a tough time relaxing. And this, again, is normal. We expect this after an experience like that. And finally, the, the way that we cope, the way that we behave in the world can also be uh, quite impacted, especially uh, common to begin to try to avoid or uh, distance ourselves from any reminders of, of an event uh, that might have happened. We may, in the case of an accident, a car accident, we might find that, you know, we don't want to drive as much and we're trying to drive less. We might find that we're taking roads that are less busy um, or driving during certain times of day. 
It's very common to have a, an increased threat response, so being very aware of any potential threats in our environment, uh, maybe checking and, 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 and being extra careful um, are, are also really common uh, reactions. And we might be engaging in behaviors to numb our emotions and numb our memories and to try to get away from, from what hurts. And it makes good sense uh, early on. Um, and it can be part of our natural reaction to trauma. In most cases, for most people, when we go through something that's considered traumatic, over time and with supports, and if we allow ourselves to remember and to feel in a gentle way, we will give our brains the chance to heal. We'll give our brains the chance to process what we've been through, make some sense of it, and, and in a way, file it more into the past. I mean, once a person goes through trauma, we might find that it feels like it's happening again in, in our daily lives in the present. But over time and with, with some processing, we may begin to feel more and more like it's something that happened to us in the past. So transient symptoms, reactions that we just reviewed are very normal while the, this processing occurs. And over several weeks and, and sometimes months, we can begin to see a decrease in the frequency and intensity of these reactions. So they don't just disappear, but they slowly, gradually start to diminish. We know in our research and our clinical work that most natural recovery occurs within the first year, but this is a very unique individual uh, experience. There are two um, main sort of common denominators or essential ingredients to the process of recovery. And the first is that in time, we begin to re-engage with what previously gave us meaning or gives us meaning now in our lives, that we are getting back to the business of living our daily lives. And the second uh, essential ingredient is that we remain connected with our supports. So people who know us, people who care about us, people we feel safe with, we are staying connected uh, with, with one or more of, of these people in our lives. And this can be very predictive of natural healing. So it does happen that we have some difficulty returning to life as usual, and we can get stuck in some of these reactions. And we have just a brief clip here of a military spouse talking about how she noticed that her partner was getting stuck in, in some of the reactions we, re we reviewed after returning from deployment overseas. Usually when they come back from a deployment, there's always that reintegration that you have to go through where everyone has to kind of get back into their routine and uh, back into kind of civilization and being out of the military setting. And when he came back, uh, one particular time, the reintegration, we couldn't do it. There was a lot of things different, and he was just basically incredibly different. He just couldn't settle in. He was very reactive, very hypervigilant. He was having nightmares, a lot of, uh, as I know now, he was having a lot of flashbacks. And he wasn't just able to reintegrate and to calm, calm himself down and get back into just the daily routine. So although it is most likely that we will recover in time after trauma, we want to review what it, what it can mean and what it can look like to get stuck in some of these reactions like this, uh, this lady was talking about. So getting stuck essentially means that there's been some disruption to the natural healing process. And these are uh, very common, very normal barriers to natural recovery that people might experience uh, in some time after trauma. So we can see that these barriers actually share two things in common. The first is that we might do these things to try to, to feel better, to try to not feel pain, to soothe ourselves, to comfort ourselves. It makes good sense in the short term. We may be uh, numbing our emotions. We may be staying very busy or using substances to do that. Uh, we might be sort of shrinking our world in a way. We're not out engaging in the activities that we usually engage in because it might bring up memories or feelings that are difficult for us. And the second common denominator here is that these are all avoidance strategies. So they're all ways to uh, stay disconnected 
from our internal experience, from our thoughts, from our memories, from our feelings. And although it makes sense in the short term, they can actually be barriers to allowing our brain to process and in that way to work on recovery. Another short video here um, with a military spouse talking about how she noticed that her husband was having a tough time coping with his thoughts and feelings and memories. When he returned, uh, he was repatriated because he was wounded while he was uh, on tour. And um, once he started recovering from his physical injuries, it became fairly evident with some of the personality traits and some of the actions that he took that um, there were certainly things that were changed. I was not necessarily familiar with what what a diagnosis could be or you know even what an OSI was at that point in time, but I noticed changes about him. Um, you know, the hypervigilance, um, he had a lot of nightmares, he had a lot of restlessness, he was um, uh, very much taking uh, time away from people, he was sort of isolating himself and uh, had a lot less patience. So I noticed traits about him and about his personality that were not the same um, post-deployment as they were prior to him leaving. A brief note about the video, it can often be the case that family members and people closest to us might notice these changes, maybe even before we do. They can be subtle and they can be gradual, and uh, it, it might be that when we're in it, we're not noticing it. But, but people around us may um, start to say, I'm noticing that, that things are changing and things are different. Although it's most common that we recover after trauma, if we are stuck in some of these reactions, we may be experiencing a mental health concern uh, as a result of, of a traumatic event. And when we think of trauma and when we think of the media and portrayal of trauma, we think of post-traumatic stress disorder most commonly. And this is a very common uh, mental health concern that people can experience after trauma, but there are a number of other ones as well. And these are just some examples of, of what uh, folks can experience. Certainly depression and, and anxiety disorders, um, substance abuse and dependence is fairly common, eating disorders and, and symptoms of psychosis can all fall within uh, what it looks like to get stuck after trauma. So we've covered a brief summary of trauma and I want to turn now to talk about loss and some common reactions to loss. So what do we know about loss and the, and the concept of loss? We know that as human beings, we have loss in our lives, that we have gone through that likely before, we may be going through that now, and we may again in future, that this is part of what it means to be human. Loss can often be associated with uh, negative events such as death and, and illness and injury, uh, losing a job or losing something that's very important to us. But it also can result commonly from very positive events in life. So things like getting married, starting a family, uh, getting a job promotion or a new job. Although we're gaining new identities and experiences, we're also leaving behind old ways of being. So with the positive and with the celebration, on the flip or the flip side of that, it's very common to also go through some grieving around what is changing and what we're letting go in that process. In response to loss, we often grieve and grief is how we experience the loss. Grief is commonly con connected with very painful emotions, hurt and sadness, fear and anger. It might also be connected with some other emotions like uh, maybe a sense of relief or a sense of gratitude. And just as there's no uh, right or wrong way to feel after trauma, there's no right or wrong way to feel after loss. We have a right to all those feelings. Mourning is actually the active a process of grieving. So grief is very unique and individual, and so too is mourning. It's how we go about the process of allowing ourselves to grieve. 
the major task, the major objective of mourning, whether we're aware of it or, or not, is to not forget what we lost, but to come to a place where we can readjust our lives, make room for the loss in our lives, and continue to live uh, engaging in meaningful and valuable things. So continuing to live the lives that bring us uh, some sense of satisfaction and some sense of meaning. We're going to review briefly some grief reactions that are common, and you're going to see that they're quite similar in many ways to reactions to trauma. And that's because trauma and loss uh, are registered very similarly, or can be, in the brain and in the body. Grief, just as trauma, affects how we think, how we feel, how we act and behave in the world, and our connections uh, with other people. If we talk about thoughts and how they might change after a loss, we might be finding that we're thinking more about uncertainty and what's uncertain in the world, things that we, focusing on things that we don't have the answers to, because loss can really shake up how we see ourselves and how we see the world around us. We might find that we're having a tough time with memory, uh, short-term memory specifically, and, and similarly, this is about the brain being really busy managing our memories and our feelings uh, and not having a lot of extra energy to absorb short-term information like where we left our phone or what appointment we have this afternoon. Common feelings and emotions uh, that we can all experience after loss, uh, certainly sadness, fear, anxiety, anger, irritability, regret, helplessness. Uh, are all very common and they may run their course. It may be that we feel different things at different periods of time as we grieve. Sadness is a very adaptive emotion and is really strongly paired with loss. When we feel sad, our bodies slow down and we have maybe less motivation and less get up and go. And the purpose of that is to actually allow our, our, our bodies, our beings, to slow down and take stock of the significance of the loss and to move forward slowly and gently. It actually promotes the healing process. So if we allow ourselves to feel sad, that's a really healthy way to begin to move through the grief. In our bodies, we, we see very similar reactions to uh, the aftermath of trauma. Sleep can be a real tough one for folks. We might be really tense. Um, and we may have that slowing down process, that lack of motivation. And we also see some strong overlap with how we might be coping with these feelings and these thoughts. We might be isolating, um, spending less time doing the things that we, we once found enjoyable or meaningful. Um, we might be avoiding friends and family. We might be avoiding any reminders of the loss that we've experienced. And, and in the short term, that's a very common, normal reaction. And the final piece here that we wanted to highlight is that going through loss can change how we see spiritual um, aspects, how we see the world around us. It can get us thinking about some of the big questions in life, and that's, that's so normal. Like, who am I? And uh, what, what is this life about? Sometimes people think, is life worth living? And so losing something so, or someone so significant can really shake up how we see ourselves and, and the world around us. And these are normal, natural questions. We briefly wanted to just give a little information about the process of mourning, because we've said that it is an active process, and it's the way that people move through the grief. There's no right or wrong way to grieve, and there's no right or wrong way to mourn. But what we found uh, in, in clinical work and in research, and this is uh, research by Dr. Rando, who's a clinical psychologist and research in the area of loss and grief, is that there are certain tasks that we engage in when we mourn, and that these tasks have a very important purpose uh, in the healing process. So Dr. Rando says that first we must recognize the loss and recognize how significant the loss has been in our lives. And before we can do that, we can't go on to the next tasks. 
we must experience the pain and let ourselves feel and identify and in some way express our emotions around the loss. People do this in very different ways. It might be that we journal or that we talk with a close friend or family member um, or that we go into the woods and let ourselves cry and remember and think or we sit by a lake and let ourselves do that. People have all kinds of ways of uh, connecting with their emotions. Uh, lots of folks that we work with are actually quite creative and um, paint and draw and sculpt and, and express themselves through those avenues and that's all good and healthy and part of it. We. Dr. Rando says we need to uh, take a look at the relationship that was lost, if it's a relationship, and look at both the positive and the less positive memories. So uh, appreciating the positive aspects of, of who that person was to us and also the, the works in progress. And that taking stock of all of, of what that, that person meant to us is a very healthy way of beginning to appreciate um, the loss in our lives and to move forward with it. Beginning the letting go process, and this is something that certainly happens over time, is an important part. And it's not about forgetting um, or distracting and, and, and trying not to think about, but it's about making room for the loss in our lives and adjusting our lives around the loss so that we can get busy with uh, a meaningful life again. So just as trauma, as the case with trauma, we can also find ourselves getting stuck in grief. And the difficulty occurs when the process of mourning is blocked in some way or in a couple of ways. Very commonly, it might be that we really don't want to feel the pain and we're really trying hard not to and that makes good sense. Um, but in not feeling the pain, we aren't able to move through it and to process it. It might be that we fi find ourselves limiting our activities and, and not doing the things that bring us meaning or not engaging in the relationships that bring us meaning. Uh, whatever the block or the barrier, there are sort of three ways to, to think about, am I getting stuck in this or am I moving forward with this slowly and in time? And these are, How's my functioning? Am I able to, to get back to my day-to-day, -day, my week-to-week -week tasks that are important? Uh, or is that remaining really limited for me? We might think about the quality of our lives and, and, and whether that's been diminished significantly and whether that's remaining diminished. And we might think about the emotional distress that we feel. With grief, with loss, with mourning, it's it's common, it's healthy to have a, an intense period of grief and loss and, and that that might diminish over time as we, as we process and as we receive support from people in our lives. And if that's staying pretty strong and pretty steady, that may be a sign uh, that we're having some difficulty moving through the morning. So wherever we are in the process of, of grief and mourning, we can certainly ask ourselves, what do I need to do to make room for this, this loss? And what do I need to do to move forward with a meaningful life? So I'd like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Barker, who's going to discuss with us trauma and loss and the overlap and talk with us about how we can manage these experiences. Thank you, Katie. So we might begin to think about trauma and loss as really two sides to the same coin. They can occur separately as Katie's talked about, but they can also arrive together in our lives as a bit of a package. That's because it can be traumatic to lose someone. For example, a loved one can die and that's the loss. Uh, and they can sometimes die in a traumatic way. So this, for example, if it's sudden, if it's violent, if it's unexpected, if it's preventable, if there's a lot of suffering involved in the death or the loss, if it's untimely, this can all contribute to the experience of this loss becoming what we call traumatic loss. It's also because we can experience loss as a result of trauma. So for example, when we experience a trauma, we can feel as if we've lost our bearing and our way of being in the world. If we get stuck in trauma, 
we can begin to lose our sense of ourselves as people, whereas once uh, we thought of ourselves as capable sort of human beings, if we're getting really stuck in trauma, we can lose our sense of ourselves and begin to think about ourselves in a really different way. Trauma can also affect our sense of other people, and that can be a real loss especially if a trauma occurs at the hands of other people. It can impact our sense of what it means to trust other people, uh, and that can be a real loss for people too. And finally, it can uh, impact our sense of the world as either a safe or an unsafe place, and that can be experienced as a real significant loss to someone. If there's a physical aspect to our trauma, like an injury, we can experience loss because of that. We can lo lose functioning. Uh, we can lose uh, the way our bodies change and our bodies work differently and that can be experienced as a loss. And finally, if we get stuck in trauma in the ways that Katie had talked to you about, uh, it can impact other areas of our lives like our relationships, um, maybe our jobs, and so we can have other losses that come from getting stuck in trauma. Finally, the emotions that we feel uh, when we go through trauma and loss are often quite similar as Katie talked about when she was showing you those diagrams. A lot of you were kind of nodding your heads and I think you probably recognize that a lot of the same emotions come with trauma as they come with loss. So they're very much connected for many people in their lived experiences. So let's begin to think about, um, so we've talked about the nature of trauma, and we've talked about the nature of loss, and we've talked about how when the two arrive together in our lives. And we've talked about that, that these experiences can really impact all of what it means to be human. It, it can affect our thoughts and our feelings, our behaviors and our relationships with other people, our sense of ourselves and our place in the world and our sense of spirituality. So when we think about what we can do, We'd like to begin to think about all the different ways we can cope, taking into account the fact that these things really have, can have far-reaching impacts in our lives. <clears throat> so one of the ways um, that we can cope is to maintain what we call resilience. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about this concept of resilience. Most people who are exposed to trauma, as Katie talked to you about, go through a period of time where it feels difficult or lost as well. They go f through a period of time that can feel difficult and challenging and then they kind of move through and they begin to move on with their lives. A and they go through that natural recovery process that, that Katie talked to you about. And that's the majority of people will have that experience. So we'd like to suggest to you as we talk about resilience that resilience is in fact um, ordinary. It's what most people have in their lives. Uh, it's not an extraordinary thing. Research has shown, in fact, that it is quite ordinary and that it's made up of different kinds of concepts. The first part of resilience is that you have to be presented with a challenge in your life. And this challenge could be a minor kind of thing, a daily hassle, or it could be one of these big life events that we're talking about tonight, a trauma or a loss. The second aspect is that People demonstrate a positive kind of adaptation. Now this is, really, this is really individual. It depends on who you are as a person, your beliefs, your culture, your role, uh, and what might be a positive adaptation for one person might not be for another. So it's really quite individual. But when we have both of these things together, this is what we mean by resilience. Another concept I think that's important to talk about when we're talking about maintaining wellness during a traumatic or grief experiences is the concept of hope. I think that you've probably taken from us today that, that it's our belief uh, that trauma and loss is not an extraordinary thing that happens, but rather a part of many of our lives. Um, and that, uh, it, that most people demonstrate incredible resilience as they move through these, these experiences. So we'd like to suggest that the experience of life is not about avoiding pain and difficulty. It's about having sometimes very difficult things happen and keeping on the path of life and keeping on putting one foot in front of the other. And oftentimes this requires hope that you can keep going. Um, I think hope is a concept that's important to human beings and has been important since there have been humans. We can see this reflected in ancient stories and legends. So one of them is the story of Pandora's box. 
Most of us uh, probably know the story or know the expression to open Pandora's box. It means to do something little and think it's not going to have very big consequences and then, oh my God, look what's happening. There's also a legend behind that saying. Um, Pandora was the first mortal woman, according to the Gre ancient Greeks. She was the first human woman. And Zeus presented to her a box. And in this box contained all the tragedy of the human experience, all the loss, all the suffering. It also contained all the hope and all the blessings and all the beauty of human life. And he told her, don't open the box. And of course, she opened the box, right? Because she's human. <laughs> That's what we do. We get curious. And she opened the box, and it released all of the suffering of humanity, all of it, and all of the blessing, and all of the love, and the gratitude, and all the good stuff of life. And it all went away, except one thing, and that was hope. This is because the Greek people knew that without hope, mortals cannot survive. We need to have hope in our lives. And so let's now turn to talk about some of the things we can do to grow resilience and to grow hope when we're going through such difficult and challenging times. <clears throat> we just wanted to put these quotes up uh, to kind of summarize our understandings of hope and resilience. And obviously, these are individual. Hope is being able to see that there is a light despite all of the darkness. And we thought this one summarized resilience. I stood in the storm, and when the wind did not blow my way, I just adjusted my sails. So we've talked about all the different ways that trauma and loss can impact us as humans. And so as we talk about specific strategies people might find helpful, we like to also break it down in these areas of thoughts and feelings and behaviors, our physical needs, our spiritual needs, uh, and our relationship needs. So let's first talk about thoughts. <clears throat> How many thoughts do you think a person has in a day? How, just showed them out, I can't. A thousands, okay. Anybody else? Millions. Millions, okay. Okay. Oh, we have some savvy folks here in this audience. People have done their research. Um, so the, uh, there's just less, yeah, 50, 60 to 70, yeah. <laughs> um, there's been some preliminary research done at the University of Southern California, the Laboratory of Neuroimaging. So um, they studied undergraduate students, as, as most people, uh, undergrad students are common participants in research studies. They're, they're quite available to researchers. So they studied these folks and they found that on average people were having between 60 or 70,000 th thoughts a day. Now this hasn't been published, it hasn't been reviewed, this is preliminary work, so don't, this isn't uh, necessarily written in stone. But I think the idea gives us like the vast amount of thinking we do in a day, right? That's what I'm trying to get home to you. And I want you to now imagine if you're having, let's say, 65,000 thoughts a day, what it feels like and what it does to your soul to have this kind of thought. 60 or 70,000 times a day. If it's kind of coming through that filter, what would that do to a human soul? Or this one? And what might it like to have instead this one? Can people see how those are different? How do they seem different to you? Blame versus experience, yeah, yeah. So as we think about moving through um, these difficult experiences, it can be really important to kind of try to develop some, some compassion and some kindness in our daily 65,000 thoughts that we have. Um, to try to be true, right? Like uh, the fact that I'm having a hard time is probably quite a truthful explanation of what's happening. We don't want it to be sunshine and roses and Pollyanna. We want, we're going for truth here, but also compassion and kindness. Think about what you might tell a friend or a loved one if they were going through this experience and begin to extend some of that kindness and empathy and love to yourself. <coughs> Let's look at our behaviors. <clears throat> I'd like you to think about, take a moment to think about when you're feeling well and okay what are the things you do every day or most of the time, like in a week or in a month, that, um, that help you feel good? These can be really individual for people. 
we want you to think about doing things that connect and t t you to sort of what it means to be you and to nourish yourself. So for some people, this might be creativity, getting lost in nature, connecting with our space in the world and the universe, uh, reading and sort of engaging our minds and being curious. And kudos to you because you're all doing that here tonight. You're trying to learn about new things. Um, we can nourish our, ourselves in all kinds of different ways. And so we begin to encourage you to think about the ways, the things you do that bring you closer to what you want in your life and what you're trying to build in your life. Katie talked to you a lot about the different emotions that people can have, and I think the sort of take home message here is that there's no one right or wrong way to feel, that it's all fair game. We as humans all feel sad, we feel angry, we feel disgusted, we feel surprised, we feel uh, connected, we feel sad, uh, and, and this is part of what it means to be human. We all have pain in our lives, we will all have pain in our lives, and we all have difficult times in our lives. There's no escaping that, it's part of the human condition. A famous therapy researcher by the name of Les Greenberg, he's a, a researcher and clinician at York University, he said that we cannot leave a place until we arrive. And what that means for our emotions is we can't let things go until we actually feel them. So we can't leave it until we arrive there. So what that means, again, is to allow ourselves with kindness and compassion to experience what's happening. And as we're doing that, to also develop ways to soothe and ground ourselves through that experience. <gasps> Our physical bodies need some attention and some care during these challenging times. The immediate things to look out for are making sure that you're physically safe and that your basics are getting taken care of. We talk to a lot of our clients in the early stages of our work of getting back to the basics. Making sure that you're getting enough sleep, that you're taking your medications as prescribed, if that's part of what, what helps you, uh, that you're eating good food, that you're moving your body, and that you're maintaining your routines as best you can. Routines is like, that's so boring, right? Like I came to the Royal and they told me to like do my routines. <laughs> but there's something quite organizing and hopeful about a routine. In the chaos of these difficult experiences, it can be very hopeful and helpful to keep putting one foot in the other and brushing your teeth and seeing your friends and going out for coffee and just doing your daily work of living. Our spirits often need special care in these times, as Katie talked to you about. And for some of us, this may mean connecting with our faith communities. Uh, if we have an identified faith community or our leaders in the faith community, they can be especially important around grief and loss and trauma. For those of us that aren't connected to any one particular faith community, we would encourage you to, to think about the idea of a compass and to think about what's your true north like what guides you in the dark days? Like what's the thing that's true to you and that is meaningful to you? What is important in your life? And doing things that are lined up with that. And using that idea of a compass to keep you moving forward and to keep you engaging in a meaningful, purposeful life. And finally, our relationships and our communities. For some of us, this means being with people and being with friends. And this is, again, very individual. Some of us are people that like to be around people all the time, and we need to have lots of people around, and that energizes us and fills us up. Other people like to have one or two close folks that they connect in with and talk with. Some of us are quite solo and need to be have alone, quite a bit of alone time, and then we sort of reach out and connect and then retreat back. And it's about honoring what works best for you and what you do when you're well to continue doing these things when you're having a hard time. The goal here is to keep feeling connected and to keep feeling a sense of belonging and a sense of purpose in your world and in your life. Um, we're going to get ready for another clip. This is, um, this is a fellow by the name of Bob Shoemaker. And he was a Vietnam uh, veteran prisoner of war. And he was in isolation for three years. And there was a number of them that were in this situation. Uh, and this is him talking about uh, what they did to, to maintain hope for themselves. 
we developed the tap code in which the alphabet was arranged in a square that had five rows and five columns. You'd say, that's the second row, second column, this is G. That's the first row, second column, B. And U is, fourth row, fifth column is the U. So GBU was God bless you. Well, you can imagine being in a cell for three years. Uh, if you weren't able to communicate, things would be pretty tough and, and, and you could get depressed very easily. So the, the TAP code really uh, uh, kept our spirits alive, our hopes alive, our dreams. So we transmitted things like French lessons through the wall and music lessons. We spent a lot of time on the wall. Social support is a key factor in becoming a resilient individual. You can't do it alone. You need other people. We've come up with the concept through talking to people like Bob Shoemaker that everybody needs a tap code. Everybody needs a way to communicate with other people to get through tough times. Bob Shoemaker was an example of that. So that's from a, um, a documentary series on PBS in the States called This Emotional Life. Um, I'm not sure if it's available online. I think parts of it are. Um, so what we'd like you to think about is what's your tap code? What's your way of maintaining connection to other people when times get real tough? And we'd encourage you to think about spending time on your wall and doing your tap code. So sometimes, despite our best efforts, uh, we can still be really struggling and we need to get some extra help. And so we've summarized this for you in the resource sheet. Uh, we'd certainly encourage you to be turning to your natural supports. Um, your family physician is also a really important factor. This person hopefully knows you well and knows your history and knows the, the intricacies of your own life and can help you potentially get connected to other supports and services if you need them. For those of us who work and have paid benefits, employee assistance programs can be helpful. Uh, they're confidential services where people can get counseling and, and therapy. Um, and so if, if, if that's an option for you, we'd ask you to think about that if, if you or your loved ones are struggling. We've listed on the website, uh, or on the resource list rather, the, the names of the um, colleges. So those are the professional governing bodies of the various registered health professionals who do work in mental health in Ontario. So um, for many people, that would mean stopping in with their family doctor and then getting connected. But certainly the college websites have listings of people who are able to see folks for more, more ongoing support. And then we at the OSI Clinic um, have developed an app called OSI Connect. Uh, it's free on Android and uh, Blackberry and Apple. <laughs> um, and. Uh, and it has self-screeners and questionnaires and lists of resources for people. And you don't have to be a military veteran or, or a RCMP member to use that. That's free for everybody. So we'd encourage you to check that out. Uh, we found a number of books to be helpful in our work with people. Um, the first is How to Go on Living When Someone You Love Dies. That's by Therese Rando. She's the psychologist that Katie mentioned in the grief section of the talk. Um, when someone you love suffers from PTSD, it would be helpful if you've got a family member or friend going through difficulties related to trauma. And then for any folks in the audience, excuse me, who are watching, who have experience as a um, Canadian Forces member, um, once a warrior, always a warrior, our clients have told us is a very helpful resource for them. Uh, cer certainly, if people are in distress, immediate distress or crisis, these resources are available to everyone. Uh, 911 in emergency or, or a, a safe go-to bet, they're, they're always there. Um, but sometimes folks need a different kind of support and a more sort of talking through, and so distress centers are often available 24-7. I want to extend a thank you to you for coming out in this evening to, to share your time with us.